So um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I have the great job of hosting our webinar series at the Florence Nightingale Foundation. I'm Lucy Brown, I'm the Deputy Director of Florence Nightingale Academy and a nurse by background. And I have the absolute pleasure of introducing Yolanda Fernandez today, who's gonna, is going to talk to us about inclusive leadership around that it's actually a journey, not a destination. And really talking about that pathway to belonging and trust, which I think is absolutely crucial for all of us to learn. So I think really great uh, knowledge and wisdom that Yolanda will share with us. Um, Yolanda is a children's nurse by background, um, a coach as well. So coaches um, and is also an organisational culture and change facilitator and has a personal and professional interest in inclusive leadership and is also a EDI expert too. So it brings a lot of knowledge and wisdom. And I call I call Yolanda a sage. <laughs> I hope she doesn't mind. But it's um, whenever I speak to Yolanda, I learn so, so much. So um, just to make aware, we will be uh, recording the webinar this morning. So just be mindful of anything you pop in the chat or any comments you make. Um, if you want to discuss that further, please let myself know or any, any member of the team. Um, we will be having the recording available. So if any of your colleagues um, couldn't make it today, you'll be able to share it with them. Um, it should be available in a couple of days. Um, we will be taking Q&A. So at the end of the session, please feel free to pop that in the chat box. Um, if you'd, um, you can do that and I can ask on your behalf. Or alternatively, you can raise your actual hand or your virtual hand and ask Yolanda a question um, directly. Um, we also um, wanted to let you know, be, uh, there'll be a couple of sessions we want to be a bit interactive. So you could grab a pen and paper so you don't miss out on any of uh, the great information that Yolanda is sharing. Um, I think it'll be a really great session today. So without further uh, delay, I'm going to hand across to Yolanda, who's going to share her wisdom and knowledge on inclusive leadership. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to I welcome you this morning, Yolanda. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for that rather generous introduction, um, uh, which I shall accept graciously. Um, mm -hmm. I noted you um, referred to me as an expert. I'd like to mm -hmm. present myself today as an evolving uh, leadership, uh, inclusive leader. Um, and just very quickly to say that here where I'm sitting today uh, with improved knowledge around inclusivity and why it's important is because of a mentoring uh, experience I had of mentoring a young uh, lady who was half my age, but also uh, happens to be a nurse, but um, was the chair of her local trust BAME forum. And as I was mentoring her about her own leadership development, I learned a hell of a lot about um, uh, diversity, uh, uh, equality and inclusion. And that's where my interest developed to explore inclusivity and how we can actually uh, de develop our leadership skills. So if she's in the audience, I don't know. I did send her the invite, thanking her for uh, being able to work with her. I considered myself a mentor. So I mentored her, but I also in turn as a way of learning from someone who's younger. And that's fantastic because I think as someone who's retired from the NHS after 42 years of service, I'm also consider myself a modern elder an elder because acknowledging I am an elder, not elderly, but I'm modern in the sense I'm curious and open to learning. And I think that's my journey ahead. So that's my introduction here uh, to you. And I'm also a recovering perfectionist. That is part of my ability to give up being a perfection perfectionist and actually showcasing my vulnerability as an opportunity to learn. So today, I'm going to talk about inclusivity as a development pathway to belonging and trust. And it's about developing your own leadership skills as you progress in life. So the challenges around diversity, equality, and belonging and trust are not new. Yeah. However, given our current experience and impact of the global health economy, a global health pandemic, there seems to be a palpable sense of urgency for us to review and reconstruct how we show up in the diversity, equality and inclusion space so that our actions are visible, consistent and more importantly, impactful. If we are to move, I think with optimism to create a better tolerant, sustainable future for ourselves and wider society, I think we need to review our leadership skills and styles 
and invest in shifting our mindsets, if not, and behaviors uh, towards inclusive leadership uh, style of doing and being in the world. Adam, next slide. So I stand here in front of you, uh, really appreciating and graciously accepting the time you've given to attend and participate. So what we'll cover today in this one hour uh, webinar, which I hope to complete in 45 minutes, so we have time for questions, is I'm going to talk to you about why inclusion matters, some of the obstacles that get in our way, and then I'll walk through the six signatory traits of inclusive leadership. This is a framework that's been developed by Deloitte's. And this whole idea of using that framework to develop a learning pathway that will improve your own inclusive leadership skills, no matter where you are in your career or life. It could be right from chief executive down to frontline staff. It doesn't really matter. You create your own leadership development skills uh, uh, pathway. And finally, I shall share with you the self-awareness archetype, which is the foundation for inclusive leadership. And this is work done by Trisha Urich, and I'll share some of her references with you. So I hope these meet with some of your expectations, but I would like to say that this is like dipping your toe in the water. There's a hell of a lot more that needs to be done. And in my coaching work, I either work with individuals one-to-one -one in talking them through a much more in-depth way of developing their leadership skills. I also work with teams who want to address it as a team. So uh, they also have like half-day workshops because it gives more hands-on working. So today, I hope I leave you with some little gold nuggets to take away for consideration and some resources as well to, to refer to. Next slide. So why inclusion matters. This is where I'd like to invite you to grab your pen and paper. And I'd like you to think of a time you observe someone leading inclusively. It could be a scenario at work. It could be a scenario at home. It could be a book you've read. It could be a movie you've watched. It could be an interview. It could be someone in sports, anything like that, that you witness inclusive leadership in action. What does it mean to you? But concentrate on the behaviors, two or three behaviors that you felt illustrated inclusivity in action and why it resonated to you. Why did it really attract you? And let's spend like one or two minutes doing it. Don't think too overanalyze it. Just think and just I would invite you to put it in the chat box so we can see some of the thoughts that are coming up and then look at how we can inf include that in our dialogue as we go along. So just two minutes. They don't have to be full sentences, just behaviors. Right, anyone feel comfortable about sharing? That's lovely, Haley. Slowing down and taking the time to consider. Brilliant. Pay attention to all members of the group. That's about inclusivity. Coco asking questions to better understand. Yes. Allowing people to be heard. Wow, they're coming fast now. Listening, listening, body language, honesty and passion. Wonderful. Adapting styles to cater, Caroline asking questions. Yes. Listening, wow, listen, feeling, feeling valued and heard. Lucy, well done, yes. Openness, asking people's opinions, excellent. Ah, wonderful, willing to do things differently. Well done, Haley. Yeah, that's Tina. Felt like I was part of the team, wonderful. That's lovely. So, you know, I think you'll have already identified some of the key qualities and skills and behaviors that's required for uh, inclusive uh, leadership. So then let's move to the uh, next slide, please.
So what is inclusive leadership? I think the slide captures some of the feedback you've put in the chat just now. You know, staff want to feel they are treated respectfully and fairly, that they are valued, that they belong. Now, belong is, seems to be a new thing that's coming up. So there's a lot of concentration on diversity, equality, and inclusivity. And then now suddenly we've moved saying, yes, you can include me, but do I get that sense of belonging? And then from the belonging comes trust because you're trying to create that environment where people feel they can speak up, they can be heard, they'll be listened, and they have an opportunity to test out new things without being blamed or, or shut down. And that's really key. I heard someone once say that um, inclusion, no, sorry, uh, diversity, equality means, uh, I've got this wrong, inclusion means in being invited to a party or, or a dance but belonging is about being asked to dance. And I thought that was so lovely. So you can be invited as part of an invitation to come, but if no one asks you to dance, that doesn't give you that sense of belonging. And I think that is something where the belonging is becoming more urgent now, where staff want to feel they belong because only then can you get that trust. And this thing about being intrinsically motivated to be their best self. Uh, when you feel included, that's where you are inspired to show up your best selves. We tend to concentrate on external motivators, which are important, like salaries and grades and things like that. And then really having the equal opportunities to succeed. But we'll cover that in more detail as we, as we move along. Because one of the things of uh, doing all these things about inclusive leadership is getting tougher now, is uh, because your, our environment is constantly changing given the pandemic. And when I say constantly changing, it's not just where you work, it's across the political, socio-economical ecosystem landscape. So you just have to think about hybrid working, remote ways of gathering as we are doing today, how we learn in a different way, the impact of climate change, travel, et cetera. When I still hear people say, I can't wait to get back to the old days, I kind of want to put up my hand and say, old days ain't coming back. <laughs> this is about opening up with an open mindset and growth mindset to think of new ways of doing things. Okay. Next slide, please. So now that we've kind of identified what inclusive leadership looks like and why it matters, what it's not is equally important to understand that. Because when you're aware of what leadership is, inclusive leadership is not, it can help you to adjust of the way you show up in the world, to become more aware of some of the, the barriers that come in or understand what it shouldn't look like. So what do we mean by performative? Performative is when people show up and are quite bombastic and have outbursts about talking about some social injustice being done. So we've seen a lot of this in like the football world recently, and, uh, and other places, you know, and even in cricket, etc. cetera. And what what's more important is what changes because it's all right to be bombastic, particularly given social media and stuff like that. But then the verbal commitments don't match action and don't match changes in infrastructure. So the talk doesn't match the action on the ground. And so there is that gap, all right? It's certainly not competitive, and this is not hero leadership. It's not warrior leadership. It's not a solo flyer. This is about collaboration, connection, seeking out support, and it's depth. It's not incon inconsistency doesn't work. It has to be consistent. It's not for one day. It's not for one month. It's not for the year. It is has to be consistent practice on the ground. I was at a, a meeting once where they were talking about um, Black History Month in October. And it was a specific day that was allocated for staff to have time off to be able to come to it, et cetera. And one individual said, that's great, but can I just say that why do we do it just for one day? Because for the rest of the 364 days, I'm still Black. <laughs> and although people laughed, it landed with me sort of saying, that's really interesting. You know, do we do things just to pay lip service or do we really do things 
because it matters, because we want the change to happen. So I that is something that needs consistency of action. Definitely not time bound. As I said, it's not a destination. It has to happen as normal practice. It's the way we do things here. And it's always not comfortable. And by this, I mean, not everyone will be open to creating a culture that is tolerant of diverse opportunities, et cetera. But this is where an inclusive leader is prepared to step into areas of discomfort and lean into areas of discomfort and be able to hold people to account, but not so much. There's been a change of issue around where people say, if you see something that's unacceptable, call it out. If you witness something, call it out. Don't just keep quiet. But now they say that that's quite confrontational when you say call it out. Now the new term is call it in. And the call it in is quite interesting. It's something I'm practicing to try and be humble enough to step into the other person's shoes who's actually disagreeing with what I believe and value. Let me try and understand what is that individual's experience? Why are we not on the same page? And I think uh, an analogy that I can give is what we are going through currently, where staff who are pushing back against being vaccinated, you know, and the debate could go on and on, but can we actually step back and make time to understand what is behind that refusal to be vaccinated? You don't have to agree with it, but you can accept it. You're developing your own self-awareness. So I think that that's important, but quite challenging. And one thing that inclusive leadership is not, it's not linked to role or title or how long you've been there. Inclusive leadership can be practiced by everyone in the organization, irrelevant whether they have authority or they're a frontline worker. And we, I personally have experienced that a lot. I learned a lot around uh, uh, from people who normally are not considered to be leaders. But in my own practice in the NHS, I, I would say I learned a lot uh, from people who were considered ancillary staff or, or things like that. But we'll cover a bit more as we go along. Okay. Next slide. So why invest in so much time and effort? Why does it matter? Research by Harvard Business Reviews say that there definitely is benefit. They have, their research results show 59% increase in innovation and creativity and 49% in uh, very creative ways of problem solving. Now, if those are the things that one can benefit because of inclusive leadership, then I think it's definitely worth investing in both development and time. So as an individual level, you get better performance and increased sense of belonging. Teams, better collaboration, they're more creative, but and at organizational level, which is critical given our current situation, it boosts the reputation of the organization. It becomes like a magnet organization where people want to come and work. And it helps with recruitment and retention the focus very often is on recruitment, but people don't stop to think, what about the people leaving? Why are they leaving? Why are they not happy here? So that's something that's definitely worth investing in. Next slide. So, so far, everything is pointing to the direction that inclusive leadership is definitely needed in the current climate. So what gets in the way? We all arrive to work with good intentions. We all want to do the right things. And there is no doubt some organizations do have systems and processes in place to minimize any gaps to allow this sort of culture of inclusivity. However, attention now needs to be paid to individuals' mindsets and behaviors. So you can have some most amazing policies and things like that, mission statements, et cetera. But how do we then translate that into action on the ground? And that requires a change in mindset and behaviors. And a lot of it, when you sit to study what it is, it's all this issue around failure of making a mistake. So you don't want to say something just in case you get it wrong. Yeah. Then there is the shame and guilt where you look back and think, oh, you know, when that was said, I should have said something. 
because I don't think it was appropriate. And very often you kind of center yourself rather than instead of the most impacted. So when you get a group of staff who try to try and raise some injustice, et cetera, you try and justify it to sort of say, well, that wouldn't happen in my organization. I don't think that that's right, right? And then this ability to explain data and deny that a problem exists. And we see this playing out in our hospitals as we get all these scandals that break out, you know, the maternity scandal or some other scandal. It's always, oh, but our data says so-and-so, it can't possibly be having happened. So we are going to do an investigation. <laughs> so we get into this uh, uh, treadmill of further and further investigations, rather than just acknowledging there's a problem which we will try and look into. Because very often you find when, and particularly sometimes when I'm working with senior leaders, when we address this issue, they feel that by apologizing or ex acknowledging a problem, you're accepting liability. And that's not the case at all. You know? So they don't want to accept liability. They're not afraid to say sorry, but they kind of worried and fearful of, about the uh, liability issue. Focus of equality and equity. This was in fact new to me because unintentionally people tend to use it interchangeably. But I think the difference is very important for us to think about. Equality is about making the resources available to all, i.e. The, the, the opportunity to all. But equity is about giving the individual the resources they need to respond from where they are in their context. So it's not a one size fits all, you know, just sign up for this course and you're okay for equality. No, it's what do I need as a frontline staff versus someone who's a senior manager. They're different things. You may just want to shadow someone. Someone else might want an opportunity of a secondment. Someone might want to go into a different industry just to observe how they do things. And so the resources made available should be individually uh, uh, planned. And that's the difference between equality and equity. Next slide, please. So, we come to the Deloitte framework, six traits of inclusive leadership. At this point, I'd like to say there are several uh, models and frameworks that could be used to guide inclusive leadership. And I, before when I was invited to do this presentation, I did do a Google to look at what else has been done. And I know inclusive leadership has featured at the RCN, at NHS England, and lots of other places. I particularly have chosen this framework because I think it lends itself really nicely to develop a development pathway uh, for, for yourselves in, in developing these skills. And they are interrelated. And I like it because it's not linear. You can step into each one, undertake an audit, a baseline assessment, and then you can invest which of the traits you, you're doing well in, which where are the gaps, and one might come up and think, oh my gosh, I didn't even know this was a trait of inclusive leadership. So it's quite nice. You don't have to do it in a linear form. You can step in and out and assess yourself. Here, I would share with you that since I've started using this framework for myself, I check in every four months and undertake the audit. And I surprise myself. So sometimes in some places I actually regress. And I think, oh, what was happening in my at that stage in my life? Why did I regress? Other times I'm doing really well yeah, and I'm pleased about my progress. So I do this as part of my evolving leadership, inclusive leadership skills development is check in and use it as an audit tool for yourself. So let's walk through. So visible commitment, courage, awareness of bias, cultural intelligence, curiosity and collaboration. That's a beautiful framework to kind of get you on the road to develop your skills. Next slide. So the first one, visible commitment. This is about a inclusive leader demonstrating their commitment, which is grounded in lived experience. They are great storytellers. They reflect the local context and they show up as human beings, not as this uh, demigod who's in charge of the hospital and uh, you know, is going to be uh, considered by CQC as an excellent hospital. And it's all about self-praise of their particular leadership. 
This is about an individual who walks the talk. They don't really know what challenge they're going to get, but they're prepared to, to get out there and hear. Right? They are considered to be the organization cheerleaders. So they're able to connect frontline staff to the strategy that they are promoting, the mission statements, the values, and all those wonderful things that, that people present, they actually are the bridge to bring it and make it real for the people. And here I will very quickly tell you a story that stays with me, and it includes the NASA story, the space station, where the chairman or chief exec, I can't remember, is part of his walk the talk and being an inclusive leader, walked into the room where they, when they are launching, um, uh, I was going to say a rocket, but that's very simple language, isn't it? It's quite an important uh, uh, piece of work that happens, launching of the you know, next Apollo or whatever. And he saw the man, um, uh, he was mopping the floor, but I thought he asked a very intelligent question. He looked at the man, said hello, and asked him, what, is one thing he enjoys about his work at NASA. I say it's an interesting question because he asked a positive question. He didn't say, oh, how do you like working here? Because he could have got a whole heap of problems. He asked a positive and appreciative inquiry type of question. And the man without hesitation said to him, I love the fact that I send men to the moon. Wow. <laughs> Never mind, I've got a mop in my hand, but I actually get up in the morning, come to work because I help send men to the moon. Hopefully one day it'll be a woman as well, but you know. Uh, and I thought, my, and the chairman was quite impressed with that and just was blown away, I think. But what he did is he followed up with action. He didn't say, oh, well done, you know, good old chap and walk off. He followed it up with action the individual got an invite to attend the next board meeting. And of course the guy was absolutely wow. And he dressed up and everything and went to the board meeting. And when he went to the board meeting, the chairman got him to sit next to him. And when the meeting started, he introduced him by name, didn't say anything about his title, said, this is John who's uh, shadowing me today. And then he told the story. And then he went to every director around the table and asked them to comment on that. And basically, everyone was so positive, blown away, da -di -da -di -da -di -da. and it comes back to the guy and he says, and that was John. There, he demonstrated someone being made visible, being heard, and being appreciated, being valued. And for the first time, that individual actually heard and got positive feedback about himself. How wonderful is that? And then he thanked him and said, you may leave now and you can go ahead and continue your good work. So that for me was really amazing. Right. So next slide, please. Demonstrate courage. I must say at the core of this trait is humility because there's an internal and external component of this. Inclusive leaderships are prepared to be brave enough and have the courage to look internally. What can I do differently? What is it that I bring to the table that might be impacting negatively? And what am I bringing to the table that can be positive? Yeah. And they use this feedback for further growth. Externally, they step up to the challenge of you know, attitudes and practices that are not aligned with the organization's uh, values and behaviors on equity and inclusion. They hold people accountable, even though it's uncomfortable. But this holding people accountable is not as a blame and shame. It is about really encouraging them to take accountability for positive action to improve the way we create this inclusive culture in the organization. Next slide. And then comes the big one. This is one of the areas that I'm constantly zooming in, zigzagging in and out, is awareness of bias. The first thing that inclusive leaders are aware of, they learn about and take action to minimize bias. It's very challenging because you'll hear that, oh, I'm not prejudiced, or I'm not biased. We all say that, you know. 
and they always apply an equity lens to decision making. So they don't just go why what they think or their beliefs are. And they generally try and implement interventions that create the opportunity for everyone. And what they tend to do is they are aware of their blind spots, not only their own blind spots, but the blind spots of the organization. And they ask themselves probing questions like, why am I giving more visibility to these individuals or this group? Is it because they are like me? Why are we seeing uh, sort of lower levels of promotion for this particular group? What's happening there? Why are individuals in this particular group tending to leave? What are we not doing right? You know, what are, why are there higher rates? So this is what we collect. We're very good at collecting data and everyone does it. But what happens, what changes as a result of data? That's the gap. And it's about being able to take one thing at a time, not big bang stuff, one thing at a time and being able to improve it. As they say, you know, uh, you might, it just takes ordinary people to achieve extraordinary things. So to really encourage individuals, create that environment where they feel they can experiment and, and, and be able to, to do things to create that culture of inclusivity. Next slide. So when we talk about bias, you know, we think, oh my gosh, what does that actually mean? You know, and, and so this is really quite interesting because there are, from the research done, which I'll tell you who's done that research, uh, we come up with four key biases. There's that anchoring biases. So what the anchoring biases is, say if you met someone for the first time and maybe, you know, they, or you got an email from an individual who's a new member of staff or something. And you seem to think, oh, wow, there are quite a lot of grammatical mistakes here. I mean, uh, how is this possible? You know, and what's their role? Oh my God, it's not very good. And then four months later or something, that individual presents a project saying, you know, da, da, da. And immediately the thing that comes to your mind is you think, oh God, it can't be very good. The person doesn't know how to spell. <laughs> so you've held that belief just from your first contact with them and you've made a judgment about them they could just be dyslexic and that is part of your inclusivity you know this thing of helping people who might be dyslexic who can do a very good job but just need that support about overcoming that the group bias is like say you could look at an interview type of thing where people get interviewed or shortlisted do you shortlist someone because we went to the same medical school or the same college or uh, what what is that about you know and then you have the attribution bias, where you're happy to hold other people or blame other people for things they have done. Whereas when it comes to you doing something similar, you always find an excuse for why it was all right for you to do it yeah, and not the other person. And then there's this confirmation bias where you're only prepared to consider information or evidence that confirm your uh, existing uh, beliefs. But if someone comes with data to show you that what your particular belief is, or challenge your belief, you kind of ignore that. Yeah. So favors ideas that confirm existing beliefs. If good inclusive leaders are aware of these and they ask themselves these questions, am I tr what am I truly observing here? What am I missing? And what assumptions am I making? Here, I'd like to leave you with a little gem. We see the world we describe. We do not describe the world we see. Sit with that for a second. Right? We see the world we describe. We do not describe the world we see. And I remember walking home from work one day and I just stopped at a corner shop to buy a bottle of water. And there were a rowdy group of young lads outside laughing, eating crisp and drinks, and obviously coming back from school. Went in, got my bottle of water, came to the uh, till, and there was a lady there talking to the gentleman who was a shop owner, saying, oh my gosh, you should get the police and get rid of these kids out there. It must be very intimidating. And, you know, I bet they come in and, you know, shoplift and things like that. She just went on this little rent. And the man just carried on billing the stuff and then finished the transaction and then said the most beautiful thing to her and said, you know, what you just said about those boys out there, they are part of my community. I knew them when they were children. 
I know their parents. They are all part of our community. And the lady said, oh, right, okay, and walked off. For me, that suddenly that wonderful golden nugget fell for me. Yeah, and I think that that was wonderful where you see the world you describe, we did not describe what we see. And that is something that's worth bearing in mind. Next slide. So now we've come to this thing. We've gone through three of the traits. And this is where I'd just like to stop for a few minutes because this is where I introduce the development pathway journal. When I do this as part of teamwork or my coaching, I actually give the individual a PDF format, which a page for each of the traits. So a page for commitment, page for courage, page for awareness of bias. And for each of those, they ask these six questions. It doesn't matter whether you're a chief exec, a director, a frontline, but these are questions you ask yourself as part of your journal. And this is part of my own journal as well. So what are you currently doing well? Where in the rooms, the improvement? How will you improve capability, et cetera? So these six questions, I'd like you again to grab your pen and paper and next slide. Because of the time limit, et cetera, let's just concentrate on awareness of bias and try and answer these three questions or even two or even one, it doesn't matter. Where is there room for improvement? How will I improve my capability? And how will I hold myself to account? So pick one pick around awareness of bias, pick a bias that you have. Remember, this is just practice. It's not real, you know, like whatever. It might be just something that's popped in your head, right? Pick it up and then look to see where is there, you know, how can I improve my capability? This is about you then identifying what resources you need in order to improve in, uh, in this particular trait. And then the, how will I hold myself accountable is what small actions you can take uh, either as an individual or with your team or anything like that. Just two minutes. And then once again, if you feel comfortable, please, can we um, uh, answer those questions? Someone's asking in the chat, can we go back to the slide, Coco, uh, which shows the biases? Adam, could you just back a slide? Yeah. Anchoring bias, in-group bias, attribution bias, confirmation bias. So let's not spend too much time because obviously we can have an opportunity to ask questions at the end. But this is about getting you to understand how to develop your own pathway and you know, building up the gaps where you would like to uh, improve but it needs to be linked to action. We are very good at putting things on paper, me included. <laughs> but when it comes to action, kicks in procrastination or I'm too busy doing, you know, because a lot of this requires internal introspection. And sometimes that's challenging because you're quite shocked uh, because it's an emotional engagement. It, inclusive leadership is a, not just about head. It's about connecting with heart, soul, and gut this mind-body connection is becoming more of a, a rec recognized as an as a, as a important thing to happen in leadership. Right, can we start uh, sharing perhaps in chat and then kind of move on? Because I know I'm running out of time. Oh, right, that's wonderful. Oh gosh, I've got only five minutes left. So let's move on and I'll pick them up as we go along. Next slide, please. So I'll just quickly walk through the next three traits, uh, which again, you can apply the journal uh, journaling uh, to as well. So cultural intelligence, this is about a wider organization. So here we get individuals, develop, uh, leaders, who are able to step out, actively understand the values and norms of different cultural groups, backgrounds, and they use appropriate styles, verbal and nonverbal, language expressions in cross-cultural encounters. They read the room, they step into a room and they don't just repeat what the strategy says. They understand what group they're talking to and they're able to 
you know, be vulnerable and learn at the same time. So this is about a much wider, this is the connection between strategy and frontline. As I said to you, all these traits are interdependent. Next slide. Curiosity. I think this is wonderful. People often see curiosity kill the cat, but I don't necessarily believe that. I think curiosity keeps you open. It allows you to develop an open, a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset. It allows you to imagine uh, like future possibilities rather than the sort of problem solving approach. It, it encourages you to suspend the voice of judgment, suspend the voice of cynicism and suspend the voice of control. This is work by Otto Sharma. He says, you know, when you come to an intervention, when you come to listen to someone, suspend the voice of judgment, listen with an open heart and mind, suspend the voice of cynicism. You say, oh, well, we tried that five years ago, it didn't work. But since then, technology has changed, ways of working has changed. And suspend that thing of control. Control is an illusion. It is fear of failure. So we think we can control. COVID has taught us we can't control. Whether you like it or not, COVID has taught us you can't control. And they check in on like whose voice is missing here? You know, what additional perspectives do I need before I make a decision? So they are always curious. They want to learn and they ask questions. Next slide. And the final one is collaboration. More so now than ever. Inclusive leadership can't done, be done solo. And it also has to have the courage to allow people to think out of the box. Okay? Trust individuals to work through. Once you create the safe boundaries for them, then allow them the freedom within those boundaries to test out things and be innovative. And I'll tell you a story in question time, if we have time, which is a really wonderful story. So collaboration is the way forward. And I think it's a much nicer, richer way as we have to work not only across organizational boundaries, but also across sector boundaries. And that's really important if we are to create sustainable futures for ourselves. Finally, the most important slide really. Self-awareness. This is the foundation of inclusive leadership. Right? And this is work done by uh, Trisha uh, Ulrich, which I'll uh, talk you through very quickly. But research done by Tasha actually shows 95% of people think they are self-aware, but guess what the real number is? 95% of people in their survey said, oh yeah, we're very self-aware. Apparently, it's only 15 to 20% that are really self-aware. So she says, unintentionally, 80% of us pitch up to work and pitch up in life, doing the wrong thing because we are not self-aware. But then she goes to say, that doesn't mean self-awareness is a waste of time, right? She says it's definitely worth investing in, but it's about asking the right question. Her further research has shown that it doesn't work because we are asking ourselves the wrong question. So when you tend to ask the why question, you tend to work from a problem, you, it's an external thing. Like say, for example, you went in for a, a what's it called, the personal development review, and you come out where you get negative feedback and you think, oh gosh, now why did that happen? Why doesn't she like me? Why this, why that? It's externally facing. If you flip that question to what, you then say, oh, what can I do to prove that I am the right person for this job? What can I do differently? So you see, you take ownership for it. And that is how you develop your self-awareness by asking what needs to change within you in how you actually show up in the world and how other people see you. Right? So this flip of the question from why to what is really key. Next slide. So this is her model. It's a four by four model. So on the left-hand side, I think uh, the slide, unfortunately, is maybe a bit blurry for you, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, the seekers are the people who just don't know. They're not self-aware and they don't care. <laughs> they just appear at work. They do their job 
and they go home. They're not interested how other people see them and they're not interested how you know they show up. What you don't know, you don't know. The introspectors have a very good insight into themselves. They know exactly what they're good at and what they're not at, good at. What they don't know is what other people think of them. And that is an important area to fix. Now, if any of y'all have done 360 degree feedback, that's the area where you get feedback, how other people see you. I had a very interesting uh, uh, part of my own coaching where I was asked as part of this exercise to write to five people an email and ask them a critical question. What is missing when Yolanda is not present? Wow. I wasn't comfortable at all. And this was part of my coaching. What uh, my coaching practice as I was uh, developing to be a coach. And I just was so uncomfortable, but I did it. And I learned some amazing things that helped me. And this thing about being able to say no without the guilt, et cetera, et cetera. That's a total different webinar. But this is about having the courage to ask for external feedback. Right? Then when you come to the right-hand side, the pleasers, I think a lot of people will say, oh, I'm here. You know, I'm always putting my other people's interests before mine, whether it's at home, whether it's at work. I find it very difficult to say no without, without feeling guilty. I'm always saying yes, et cetera, et cetera. And that is because you're seeking, uh, other. you're trying to show other people that you're a good person. And the true inclusive leaders are in the top hand, uh, right hand corner aware. Not only do they have self-awareness about themselves, but they have self-awareness about how others see them. And so they show up in the world with auth authentically who they are and vulnerable. They're okay, they're happy to admit what they don't know. This thing of fake it till you know it, I think is going out of fashion. You don't need to fake it till you know it. You need to fear, yes, but fear less. Always acknowledge that it's a fear, but fear less. You know, you're not going to die as a result of that. So be vulnerable, reach out to learn, and that's a far better quality to have and which inclusive leaders really value as a gift. Brené Brown says, vulnerability is a gift. It's a strength, not a weakness. Her book, the Gift of Imperfection is really a wonderful re reference book. Next slide. So in concluding, here are some resources. What I would say to you is uh, Tasha Ulrich's work on um, uh, self-awareness. Take a slide, take her, her quiz. She does a free quiz. Uh, and uh, I think I had put the thing on one of the slides. I think it's on the previous slide, but we can always go back to it. Uh, then there's this wonderful book on inclusively R. Ah, that uh, link at the bottom, please copy it down. Every of my coaches do it. I do it twice a year. I take the quiz twice a year to see whether my answers change. And it's really, really good. You'll get, of course, the marketing where you can invest in a course and things like that, but don't worry about that. You get quite a detailed free, free report about yourself, which is wonderful. Next slide, yeah. And then See No Stranger is a wonderful book written by a young lady in America uh, following the Twin Towers uh, tragedy where uh, the Sikh uh, population or taxi drivers were being abused and, and um, suffered. In fact, some were even killed. And she tries to change all that. And she's invented this wonderful program called The Compass of Love where she tries to understand what I said, you know, try and understand why someone is not on the same page as you. It's a really good, very easy book to read. Just visit her website, don't buy the book. You don't have to buy the book. And The Art of Gathering is just my latest beauty. It's by Priya, Priya Parker, and she's a conflict resolution facilitator. But what she talks about is how do we gather in the new world? And what's the purpose of gathering? How do we need to do it differently to make sure that people are included and feel included? And then there are some articles as well that I have recommended you all read. Next slide. So to conclude, I want you to leave today. I hope you've got some value for the time you've invested. 
Remember, this is just dipping your toe in it. I certainly don't believe my experience hasn't been that it's a destination. Is it a journey or an adventure? I think the choice is yours. The journey is slightly more directional, but an adventure is backpack, off you go. Are you going by bus? Are you going by train? You don't know. Are you going to sleep in a tent? Are you going to sleep in a hotel? You don't know. So that's the big adventure. Yeah, that requires a bit more courage and letting go, but a very enriching one. And then the last one, please, the last slide. So finally, I would like to thank you really each and every one of you for investing in your time because I see it as a gift that you graciously have given me. And I would like you to invite you to put two key learning takeaways from this time you've spent here. I've certainly not kept to my time, but <laughs> I hope um, we still have time to answer some questions and happy for you all to contact me out of this time to answer some of the questions. But I would also like you to perhaps feedback, what were you expecting that you didn't get? Because that will help me develop future workshops. And this was the last question I had was to ask, would something like this be valuable to teams and organizations as a masterclass or half day workshop? So those were the questions I asked. Thank you so much. Yeah, Ananda, thank you so, so much. So much food for thought and golden nuggets of um, information and lots of great links and, and further resources and lots of activity in the chat box, which is always great to see. So you've really inspired everyone who's on the call today, um, on the webinar today. So um, just, I think there's a few people, we will share the slides as soon as we finish today, we'll send the slides to you. So you can share those with your teams and colleagues and will the recording be available in approximately two or three days for you to share with your teams. Obviously available to members and alumni as well. So I think John is very keen. He's put in the chat box and got his hand up to ask you a question, Yolanda. So I'm gonna to go to John Hi, Welsh John. first. Yeah. Welcome John. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the organisers and uh, Yolanda very much. Um, so the question I have is, uh, I was interested in your, in your mention of audits and it sounded like that was about self-audit. Um, but more generally, how can you measure and track over time um, the inclusivity or belongingness um, in your department or your hospital to show that you're getting where you want to get and to if you intervene interventions have an impact yeah i think there are basically measurement is is uh, important but when i talked about audit i think with um there is certainly the hard data in the sense of how many people are actually engaged in 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 doing this sort of work and what are some of the outcomes uh you know have has your retention rates gone up? Do people feel included? Uh, do people feel their voices are heard? Uh, and things like that. Those can be just numbers. And then you have this whole survey thing that can go on. You know, 40 people said this, 20% said that. But this thing of heart and mind auditing, that falls in the qualitative things. And where we find the uh, most enriching thing is when people tell their stories. Now, the, the chap who went to the boardroom, for me, that's equally important evaluation of how many of us could aspire to be like that individual. That would be considered a part of the evaluation that it works. So that's part of the whole quantitative, qualitative audit. And I'm sure there'll be other, as this uh, inclusive leadership picks up momentum and becomes recognized as an essential new way, because every year you hear something, you know, compassionate leadership, servant leadership, all sorts of leaderships. When you actually look at them, they all have the same underlying uh, principles, but it's just interpreted in a different way. And it's what gets rewarded. What gets rewarded? When I work with senior executives, they are so afraid to mention the things that they'll only mention to their therapist <laughs> because the way they're uh, judged is very external, you know, targets, performance related, finances, and they are afraid, they are managing in the old style, this thing of command and control. If I let go, they don't trust the organization to deliver. You know? So that's that old mindset, which they're finding quite challenging. Mm -hmm. And I think now is being recognized as the reason why people are actually leaving, you know, they're 
they're actually resigning from their posts and moving because they're finding it quite challenging. So I don't know whether that answers your question, John, but I'd be happy to explore a bit more and come back to you because I'm sure there's work happening out there. I, yeah, I think I'd like more detail on that. The thing about surveys is interesting. We have a staff survey in the NHS, as you know, um, but it's only once a year. And yeah. period, periodically, there are other surveys, um, and people say they're all surveyed out. I mean, it might. Yes, it might, exactly. It, it, it might be a, an important tool, but we're, we are struggling, I think, to think of what the right day to day, week to week, month to month indicators. Mm they're doing the right thing yeah thank you john no i'll pursue that and i'll feedback that's why thanks john thanks for your question and thanks for joining us today anyone else like to ask um yolanda a question we've got lots of um oh coco's asked a question here so when it comes to advocating for inclusivity it can be really challenging it can feel uncomfortable are there any strategies to deal with the bias in the room and the fear of making a mistake and making the situation worse or not better Great question, Coco. Yeah, question. absolutely interesting question. Thank you for asking. And yes, you've identified a real issue. Some of the practical things you can do is to assess the where your organization is or where your team is. And then it's about engaging that sort of like networking outside the problem. So who are people who kind of align with your way of thinking and wanting to do things? So you actually contact them and try and build this momentum. So it's a bit like the activists who work these days, you know, like Greta started off standing outside some embassy somewhere and just didn't speak for days. And then the rest is history, you know. So if she hadn't done that, uh, we wouldn't have been where we are today. So it's about finding who are the people that might align with you, et cetera, and try and understand what's the pushback you're going to get. So if you are going to go to a leader where you'd get pushback uh, because they've got a very analytical mind and they want data and this and that and the other, how do you message to them first in a way that that will engage them with data and then you bring the softer stuff in, which is equally important. And then you get the reverse if you're talking to people who are more heart connected and you know more people, the being type of people. You tell the lovely story and this and that and the other, but you bring the data because you need the data. You need the balance of both. So it's not that one is better than the other, but they too need to complement. And it's how you message. And even when you want to get heard at the board level or much more senior level, is you find the person who has that space at the table, who can take on board what you're saying and represent you there. And where you get taken, now an inclusive leader would take the more junior member of staff with them and let them tell the story at the board and then support them because that's how they get seen and made visible and they learn how to get their voice heard at different arenas. So advocacy is not easy. And also it's about now engaging with the people that use your service. You know, we talk a lot about patient experience, but you know, how do we really bring them to the table? and get their voices heard, rather than just as uh, John said, you know, get them to do a survey and then you say, well, our mm -hmm. patient said, blah, blah, <laughs> as Greta says, blah, blah, and then, you know, nothing actually happens. So bring them to the table, you know, and just give them five minutes to hear them. Because what will happen in the five minutes, they learn about your challenges. They'll say, oh, we didn't know that this was your problem. So you see, they begin to understand. But if it's always, you just tell us, I love this. Well, I don't love it. But um, when I go around hospital says, you said we did, you said we did. <laughs> no, we are all in it together, not we and you, you know, so it's this, this whole mindset needs to change. Yeah, yeah. So it's not easy, but worth still investing in. Yolanda, thanks so much. I'm so sorry, everyone. We've, we've run out of time, sadly. But what's great is it's obviously generated a lot of interest for you all. And we'll make sure we make note of all the comments in the chat box as well. Yolanda, thank you on behalf of everyone today. It's so great that you're able to share your, your wisdom. And I'm sure everyone agrees with me. You are an absolute sage and share such knowledge. So thank you. Thank you so much. So many takeaways for, for all of us. Um, 
I really like the inclusive is being invited to the party, but being asked to dance is belonging. I love that. I think that's one of my key takeaways today. But thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I think Thanks the slides for your time. I really to you. appreciate that. It's an absolute pleasure, Yolanda, always. And hopefully we'll have you back again soon. Um, thank you, all of you, for joining. And please look out for our upcoming webinars. I think the next one's in a couple of weeks. So it'd be great if you can join us. Um, thanks all and have a great Tuesday.